Like 1.5 million Americans, the Reverend Don Burns suffers from Parkinson's disease, a neurodegenerative disorder. The average age for the onset is 50. Don Burns, however, was diagnosed at the age of 33. Don's medical history was otherwise uneventful. He grew up and attended high school in Indianapolis, Indiana. Later at first where he majored in engineering. Active in most sports, but his primary athletic passion was for tennis. Later tour Europe with Duke's tennis team. After attending Duke, Don met his future wife, Karen. They were married and have two children, Sin and Joy. Don graduated from Duke with a degree in engineering in 1969. He moved with his family to California and in a radical career shift entered the ministry along with his wife Karen. Don served as pastor for 11 years at La Cañada Presbyterian Church in Southern California. When Parkinson's was diagnosed in 1981, he was forced into an early retirement. Don now serves as a staff associate pastor. Since the diagnosis of the disease, his treatments have included a long list of various medications. And then in 1987, Don volunteered to undergo an adrenal graft implant at Vanderbilt University. The results of the surgery were limited, however, and lasted only 12 months. Don also researched other options, such as fetal graft techniques, which seem to have the same limited results. Parkinson's interferes with communication between neurocells. It is essentially a deficiency of certain neurotransmitters, chiefly among them dopamine, which is instrumental in controlling reflex and involuntary movement. With medications like Cinemet and Elderpril, some of Don's classic Parkinson's symptoms, such as restriction of movement, stoop posture, and gait freezing, are temporarily suppressed. But even during these on times, it takes extreme concentration for Don to perform even the most basic tasks. One side effect of his medication is dyskinesia, or an excess of involuntary movement. Without the medicine, however, Don would be virtually incapacitated. Don's battle is a daily one, and staying active is as important as medication. In Don's own words, we all have our crosses to bear, and while we don't get to choose those crosses, we can choose the attitude in how we bear them. Okay, I'm now going to go through some of my little neurological exercises that always put me through. What you're seeing now is more the Parkinson's earlier in this interview, you saw the dyskinetic movements, the extra movements, which are from too much medication. Now you'll notice more the effects of the Parkinson's. My face becomes more mask-like. My mouth doesn't move very well. It's harder to hear me. It's harder for me to articulate words. I got a tremor in my left hand. When I get up and try and walk, I'll shuffle and be stooped over. And this is the t period of the cycle. I go through in the day that's very difficult because I can't do much. And I know that if I don't get someplace where I can lie down, in the next 10 minutes or so, I probably won't be able to do anything. This gives you more feel what Parkinson's is like. It's a poverty of movement. It's a slowness of movement. It's a stiffness. It's an achiness. It sort of like feels like you kind of have the flu when you're like this. You're achy all over. It's very difficult to move. You have to really concentrate and think about each movement. People often ask if it affects you mentally. It doesn't affect us, except that it's distracting. You have your arm going, to have everything slowed down. It takes a tremendous amount of concentration just to do some very simple things that normally you would do without thinking. I've had times when I'll be lying down, it's time to take a pill. And I'll go get my glass of water like that. 
I'll maybe get halfway to my mouth and can't get it, or maybe I'll get swallow the pill. And then I start to put the water back, my hand won't go, and I just sit there shaking all the water out of the glass, drenching myself, which is always a, exciting. Shoes bounce on the way, so sometimes the little things can be difficult. I try and get my shoes over here out of the way so I have a clear path to the rest of them. If the Parkinson's is when you have to go, you have to go in a hurry. And that can be interesting too. So I try to monitor that as closely as I can. Then when I get ready to lie down, I have this little rope here that I've rigged up so I can help pull myself out of bed when I need to. I have an extra supply of water here, always usually in case my glasses are empty or something like that and I can't get to the bathroom to get them. So then to lie down in the proper position, once I get down and I'm just slowed down, I can't really move around very well in bed. It's so I have to kind of throw myself in the right position and work from there, so get up like this. Go something like that. In November of 1993, Don arrived at Loma Linda University Medical Center, where he met Dr. Robert Iacono, who convinced Don to try a new surgical procedure called the Swedish postventral pallidotomy. On the day before the surgery, Dr. Iacono reviews Don's case history. Okay, so let's just uh, review the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. By the way, today's the 30th of November. We're here at Loma Linda. Uh, part one of the unified, I'm teaching the students, part one of the unified uh, scale is cognition, behavior, mood, that kind of thing. He has no impairment of motivation, no, no depression, no mood uh, or cognitive impairments. Comes to activities of daily living, he says speech is mildly affected, slight salivation, slight difficulty swallowing, handwriting is moderately impaired, cutting food is slow and clumsy, dressing and needs occasional assistance, hygiene. Uh, a little bit of trouble. Turning in bed is somewhat clumsy. Falling, he doesn't fall. Freezing. Walking, he doesn't freeze as he's walking. Some patients will have gait freezing, where they, especially older patient with more than 10 years of Parkinson's, with classic Parkinson's, they just are walking, all of a sudden, <clears throat> they freeze. They freeze in a doorway, their, their legs lock up. He doesn't do that. Uh, he does have some difficulty walking. Of course, this is an on score. Uh, he has severe disturbance of walking when you're off. No, well, so these are basically on it. Now, how about resting tremor? Do you get resting tremor when you're off? Yes. And how no, bad I is it? I had it a minute ago. So either on or off, and it's moderately bothersome, or what? Is it this a resting tremor? No. So that's marked. That's pretty bad, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. We should see it. Put your leg down so everybody can see that, because that's really just, you just let that go, OK? Count back from 100 by threes. Seven. Let that little zealy go on your right hand so you can rest your right hand. That one go too. Yeah, it will go too. But the left tremor is more severe than the right. Yeah, the Parkinson's started on my left side. And probably it was just the one side in the first four years. Okay. Basically, basically what you know is that he's a 46-year-old Parkinson's for more than 12 years. I reviewed, I reviewed the fact that uh, during the first three or four years with early onset, sometimes we call it juvenile Parkinson's. Three or four years, they have good response to medicine, then they become hypersensitive to dopamine, and they're either off, and he's kind of off right now. Yes. They're either off or they're on with these crazy wild dyskinesias, which are these choreoathetoid movements. For instance, action tremor. Touch your nose, do that, do that trick. Open your eyes, touch my finger. Make a pointer out of your finger back and forth, right? See, it attenuates. It's not an action tremor. It's a resting tremor. Now let's see the right side. Same thing. Keep your fingers out straight. Now do that OK sign. Straighten your fingers out. Now tap your fingers repetitively like this. Faster and bigger. See, he's getting co-contraction and freezing. Can't do it. Barely can perform it. You see him freezing up there. Now tap your fingers. Show us that you can't do it. It's important because post-op you'll be able to do it. Okay, now let's see the left side then. Make a big OK sign, straighten those fingers out. Now tap them. Tap, 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 tap. It's as good as he can do. It's really pathetic, right? I mean, that's pathetic.
Well, it's not mince words. That's really pathetic. But post-op, it will be great. Just the enhanced uh, resting trimmer, which has some postural component. Therefore, it gets worse when he's standing. This has to do with vestibular input. You can see the lumbar lordosis and kind of a posture listing to the right. For some reason, he duck his knees when he's standing straight. Head tilts to the right. And the left side is worse, and that's why we'll start for the right brain for the pallidotomy. Uh, I'd just like you to face this direction, okay? Take two steps forward. Right. Now, tell me where you were born. Where was that? Good. And you can see that he has very little postural instability, recovers quite well, despite the fact he's relatively off. This is more like classical Parkinson's. Uh, these vestibulospinal things are relatively preserved. Okay, go ahead and walk over there. Fast as you can. Faster. Turn to your right, turn. You don't have to march, just walk normally. That's your normal walking. You're freezing. Are you freezing? Go through the door then, Burns. Go ahead and walk through that door. We see a little gate freezing there, you see that? Go out, let the door shut and come back in freeze at the doorway, but there is a gate freezer. Good. Right, go ahead and walk right, right, fast as you can. Faster, faster. Walk fast. You see he's freezing? Yeah. You see that gate freezing? Now, let me, let me show you what I can do. If I pretend like I'm marching or going up steps. So he has to do these things in order to overcome some of that. Sometimes he can run when he's this slow. Oh, I bet he can. Oh. Uh, <laughs> see, there's no postural instability. All right. Now, let me see you do tandem walking, like Indian walking on a, on a wall. Exactly one foot in front of the other. Want to send all over? Yeah. <laughs> Try it. It's kind of unsteady. Have a funny posture. What is this? Yeah, no, no. I, I'm emphasizing this. It's so much better by tomorrow afternoon. Gosh, we've never done that game. No, we don't want any extra emphasis on the arms. Hold your arms by your side while you try that this time. If you have to, just go ahead and fall over. that should arrest 70 to 90 percent of the tremor. I don't want That's you, great. I don't want you to interpret any residual tremor as any partial failure of the operation. Right. right. But we should eliminate dyskinesia bilaterally with some luck and dystonia and rigidity and improve gait and balance and uh, reduce the amount of freezing, improve sleep and eliminate the sweating. This Woo. is our these are our target symptom goals, okay? The following day, December 1st, 6 a.m., Don checks into the hospital. Good morning. He mentions that the previous night it took him over two hours to eat a steak dinner due to severe dyskinesia. He is first taken into a pre-op room where they numb his scalp and attached a halo base frame used to stabilize Don's head during surgery. Don then moves to the MRI or magnetic resonance imaging room. After several scans of Don's brain are completed, Dr. Iacono will use this information to identify the target areas. We've uh, managed to take a uh, <clears throat> four millimeter thick MRI cut horizontally through the brain 
and the plane of the AC-PC line, which you can see here, this is the, the white area in the exact middle of the brain we use as our benchmark. You can see the anterior commissure is this dark uh, fiber band cutting across to connect both sides of the brain there, and anterior commissure here. This is an exact benchmark that we call the anterior commissure, posterior commissure, plane and line. If we draw a line across here, we, we can relate this to our standard brain maps. Here's an example of a proton weighted image which gives you some idea of greater detail within the globus pallidus. You can see again that internal uh, raffe separate that little line separating the internal and the external globus pallidus. And then those dots are actual target points for this patient's surgery. Uh, at the very extreme posterior margin of the internal globus pallidus on both sides. And you can see those are the targets that we've chosen for its posterior pallidotomy. That's, another pr that's a very pretty picture of bilateral targets. And those dots define, are defined by longitude and latitude, like somebody said, line and column. We have XY coordinates of those that are down to 1.2 millimeter. This is 21st century neurosurgery, where we take the coordinates from, from here. But then I combine those old techniques to give us uh, updates on our na actual navigation upstairs. Because although the probes are great, and although we can measure things, it's good to double check depths and final position of these probes, which sometimes can be off by a millimeter or two. Don is the first patient to have a bilateral polydotomy. Prior to this, surgery was performed one side at a time, the second side usually following months later. Dr. Iacono chose to do both sides on Don because of the severity of his condition, his younger age, and otherwise good health. After calibrating his coordinates, Iacono makes some adjustments and checks the path of the probe using a model before attaching it to the halo ring. He then rechecks target areas using x-rays to make certain that the angle is correct and then makes his final adjustments. He then attaches electrical current to the probe and is ready to begin. Due to a lack of dopamine from an area of the brain called the substantia nigra, certain normally active areas of the brain, such as the putamen, become suppressed, while other areas, like the external and internal globus pallidus, become hyperactive. The Swedish pallidotomy technique is a small pearl-sized lesion created by a heated probe inserted into the internal globus pallidus. The lesion limits the abnormally high output from this area. This signal, in turn, now moves along a pathway which eventually splits into two, one leading to the thalamus, where the normalized signal limits dyskinesia, rigidity, and tremor, and to the brainstem, where it returns to the locomotive center, or peduncula pontine nucleus, to normal, eliminating symptoms such as akinesia, stoop posture, frozen gait, and the on-off phenomenon. Accuracy is vital since the internal globus pallidus lies so close to the optic pathway and visual checks are done several times during surgery. The Swedish pallidotomy is a new technique which differs from the less successful pallidotomies of the 1950s due to the isolation of this new target area and the relatively new discovery of this split in the pathway leading from the internal globus pallidus. During the entire procedure, Don remains conscious, providing Dr. Iacono with constant feedback. Before the actual lesions are performed, Iacono first uses a test current in order to artificially induce a tremor as a method of checking Don's extremities for rigidity to ensure the probe is on target. After positioning the probe, Iacono prepares to begin making the first lesions. He then checks Don's visual field using a ruler. This will be done each time the probe is readjusted throughout the surgery. Once the first lesion is made, Dr. Iacono leads Don through a series of coordination tests. Don will be asked to repeat these tests each time a new lesion is created. This type of immediate feedback is invaluable. 
providing Dr. Iacono with the best indication as to the progress of the surgery. An x-ray is taken each time the probe is moved further along. Each of these x-rays is then cross-referenced to the previous one. Using these x-rays, Dr. Iacono is able to achieve an accuracy rate within one millimeter. The results are dramatic and instantaneous. After the lesions are performed, Don demonstrates his newfound dexterity. Pleased with the results on the right side of the brain, Dr. Iacona then immediately moves onto the left. The same steps and adjustments are made, and the probe is then inserted into the left side of Don's brain. Identical coordination tests are done as Iacono then begins the second series of lesions. Dr. Iacono's first bilateral pallidotomy is performed in just over three hours. Bilateral's not hard. The second one's easier than the first. Very worthwhile. Nice to see his result. It really is. He's just getting that whole surge of reversal of his akinesia all at once. It's a beautiful thing to watch. Don describes his post-operative feeling as a resurrection-like experience. Once reunited with Karen, Don is quick to show off his new abilities for her. <laughs> One week later, Don returns to Loma Linda for a post-op checkup. Let me see that hand. Okay. Okay, sign. Make them straight. Straighten those straight fingers, fingers out. Okay, tap them. They do oh, hurt that middle finger playing yes, baseball. Yes. Yeah, playing basketball. Yeah, that, that basketball. That's okay. a baseball finger. Just go ahead and make okay, yeah. sign. Tap them. Extends your tendon. So there's, that's, I think that's straight. little stiff, a co contraction, left side. Hold your hand flat. Turn it. Ooh, that's good. Now, uh, close it tight and go. Thump. Fast, isn't it? Beautiful. Now, snap your fingers on the left if you can. Beautiful. Now, one, two, three, four thing. That looks very good. Yep. Very good. Very nice. Very nice. Good. Now, the other side. OK sign. See, the OK sign's the most sensitive. Mm -hmm. A repetitive finger tapping, please. That, that, that. Make a little rhythm in your mind. That, 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 that. Still some co-contraction of bradykinesia. Now, these. That works much easier, doesn't it? Good dexterity. Now, the, this one, see, you can't see the fingers come out. Now, flat, uh, uh, perfect, you see. Then this one, over again. Now, repeat. No, there's no contest. That's perfect. Let's see the other side. No, no, clean, clean. I, don't make a blur anyway. <laughs> Okay, snap your fingers on the right. Can you do two fingers? Ooh. I can't do three. Okay, so your hands work better than your surgeon. <laughs> Not bad. Okay. Where were you born? I the last Wednesday. So. No, this is not the average pull test. <laughs> <laughs> Cannot knock him over. Okay, now there's a better one. You did this when you were a boy? You know this one? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Turn that way. You know, so there's no stoop posture. Okay. Dan, stand on one foot. Stand on the, okay. 
Wait a minute. Can you do that? Now they're doing all kinds of acrobatics. Not bad. So your feet are stable. Put, do the tandem position. You couldn't do that before. No, I know you couldn't do that before, because you couldn't do it very well post-op. He was doing this slowly with a little bit of wiggling. Look at this. As steady as you and I, Dr. Bacon. Absolutely. As steady as you and I. Now, come my way. Walk backwards. Stop. Stop. <laughs> Is there anything that you feel you can't do normally now? Okay. Is there any symptom of your Parkinson's disease which is still a symptom that you can feel is interfering with your life? You feel free of the effects of your Parkinson's disease now after bilateral pallidotomy. And it's 24 hours a day. I feel totally free 24 hours a day. I I can go right through the day, through the afternoon. I don't need to take rest like I used to. Um, everything moves, everything functions, everything works. It's and so when I tell people that pallidotomy is better than fetal graft, <laughs> hey. they not to believe it. Okay, so it's important because it's the first simultaneous bilateral pallidotomy to ever be performed that I know of, and they said it couldn't be done. They said it couldn't be done because first it was bilateral. They said it couldn't be done because he had adrenal graft in Vanderbilt, and they said his brain was, was uh, too structurally damaged to be safe. They said it couldn't be done because it wouldn't work. They said it couldn't be done because he had uh, chronic osteomyelitis of the scalp and skull because of the work done at Vanderbilt in chronic infection. They said it couldn't be done because there was some financial consideration. That's why we decided to do both at once to save $15,000. They said it couldn't be done because it just wouldn't happen, but it happened. Okay. Um, I think that it's a very good time to have Parkinson's disease. And uh, when I say that, I'm not being smart or anything. If, if you have it now, then it shouldn't be a problem for you. It's almost a beaten disease. We've, we've almost got it whipped. And, um, I think for many patients, uh, that's going to be true. There's more than hope. Just four months following his surgery, Don fulfilled a lifetime goal, skydiving. His appetite for life only increased by his newfound health. At the completion of this film, in August of 1994, Don continues to lead a normal life and should continue to do so, virtually free from the effects of Parkinson's, thanks to this revolutionary technique. Dr. Iacono has gone on to perform numerous bilateral pallidotomies with tremendous results.